Reach out the door on time. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Yeah, Products and agriculture going to chat to us about big data and agribusiness, but I think first of all, it's a very interesting survey for us to talk about. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at the Future in Food. So I wanted to try something a little different because. Um, you know, it's not typical that I get to have such expertise in the room on the agribusiness Irish sector. So I want to do a quick poll and get your input. And so if you haven't already, or even if you have, you know, take out your smartphone and go to the URL polleb, P-O-L-L-E-B, dot com, slash food161. And if you do that on your smartphone, you'll see a window pop up in your browser that asks a question that I'd like us to know the answer to. And that's in one word, what's the biggest challenge to achieving greater sustainability across the agri-food value chain? So any word you like, and if you're passionate, you can even answer more than once, and it'll pop up on the screen in a dynamic word cloud, and if more than one pe person answers the same thing, uh, the word gets bigger. So we can all see a little bit about what the challenges this esteemed group thinks are really there for us in greater sustainability. So this is, this is phenomenal. Thank you for the input. I mean, these are really significant challenges. Uh, perception, consumption, data, regulation, climate, these are important challenges that face us all. I was, I was reading, I don't usually get to read the Irish Times, but I was reading it yesterday at breakfast, and I noticed it was saying that 30% you know, of uh, Irish uh, CO2 emissions was due to agriculture. And this was, of course, around all the climate change talk. And the question is, how do we get and achieve greater sustainability? And looking at these challenges that face us that you've, um, that you've noted, you know, I'm really curious about how technology and how innovation um, can help us answer some of these challenges that face us all. So what I'd like to speak of um, is in the future of, in food is about big data. Big data across the agribusiness value chain. And you may have noticed I'm from IBM. And so, you know, we're, I'd like you to do another thought experiment with me really quick. So you guys in the back of the room, you're going to have to talk really loud. But just shout out. When I say a word, I want you to shout out the first thing that comes to mind. OK? You with me? All right, here goes. What's the first word that comes to mind when I say IBM? Okay. I didn't hear anybody say agriculture. Right? I, no one even here said food. Right? So one of the things I hope you leave with today, after my 20-minute talk, is to understand a little bit about why IBM here at The Future in Food. You know, because I believe we have a very important role to play in terms of innovation and uh, technology of big data across the agri-business value chain. Um, so that is, of course, the main point I want to make today, is that I think big data and cognitive systems, which I'll define later on, are going to enable new innovations across the agribusiness value chain that I think are significant and important for us achieving greater sustainability. And here listed are just a few of the areas um, that where IBM research is working. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to do three things. I want to tell you a little bit about where I come from in IBM. I want to talk about data. This is a topic that's come up in multiple speakers' talks today. And then third, give you a little bit of a taste of some of the innovations that we're working on where I come from at IBM Research. So IBM Research. I, am, um, I have been with IBM Research for the past 21 years since getting my PhD in mathematics, and I'm a research scientist. You know, just by a show of hands, how many people have ever worked with someone from IBM Research? Is anyone? Great. So there's at least, at least two, two, three hands out there. That's, that's phenomenal. Our slogan, we've, we've changed at IBM Research um, as IBM has changed, and our slogan is the world is our lab. I come from the research headquarters at IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York, and we're really gifted to have a lab here actually in Dublin. So we have more than 3,000 research scientists um, across 12 labs globally on six continents, and our 13th lab is gonna be in South Africa. 
We invest more than $5 billion in innovation a, a year from these labs. So there's a lot of powerhouse here um, where I come from, where we look not just to solve problems um, of interest, but problems that are going to make a huge impact for IBM and its clients. Um, so I came to IBM Research with my PhD in mathematics because IBM has the largest industrial mathematics department in the world. So it's really a fascinating place when it comes to looking at data and trying to figure out how to get actionable business insights. One of the things that IBM Research does every year, which is a major deliverable for our CEO and our vice presidents, is something we call the Global Technology Outlook. So we try to give some headlights into the future of what's going to happen three to five, seven years down the road that's either a significant opportunity or risk for IBM and its clients. And there's something that's happened the last couple of years that I wanted to share with you. And that is our global technology outlook has been all about data. Back in 2012, I had the privilege of being able to lead this worldwide year-long effort that is presented to our CEO in a six hour long board meeting. And everyone was talking about volume of big data, size of data. You know, we called out the speed, the variety of data sources, and I think importantly for sustainability and agribusiness is the veracity. How do you manage uncertain data at scale? Because unlike many industries, it's a great side of a great amount of supply side uncertainty when it comes to agribusiness, food and agribusiness. The following year, we looked at not just the single trends that much of the industry was looking at, social, mobile, cloud, big data analytics, but we looked at the confluence of these things and what we called um, a system of engagement. And last year in 2014 Global Technology Outlook, you know, we called out the fact that the greatest value came not just from the system engagement, but from marrying that with the system of records. So for example, it's wonderful when I got targeted marketing for me, um, telling me to buy uh, tickets at a discount price to Ireland. You know, that was a personalized system of engagement, but would have been really fabulous if they'd noted I'd already bought the ticket a few hours ago. So it really didn't make sense to send me that offer. They needed to marry the two together. And so for us to create those system of insights takes three things. First, you need an engine that's going to derive the insight. You need cloud to be able to deliver it. And thirdly, and most importantly, you need the data. This year, surprisingly, it was still all about the data. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how data is going to transform and disrupt entire industries. Now, you all have seen hockey stick diagrams like this that show phenomenal growth of data. And it's, it's really astounding. Um, this chart shows, by our analysis, that by 2020, in just five years, that the amount of data is growing exponentially and will be 44 zettabytes. Does, does anyone know what a zettabyte is? No? I didn't either. It was a one followed by 21 zeros. I mean, that is an enormous number. It's absolutely huge. But really, even perhaps more interesting about the size of the data is how the nature of the data is, is changing and how the information technology to handle and, and extract value from that is changing and what that means for us as we look for sustainability. A huge amount of this growth, as you can see from this chart, is going to be in unstructured data. So that's from all the cell phones, that all the answers to the quiz, or not quiz, but the poll that you just answered came from, from wearables you might have, from tablets, from all the sensors and machine-to-machine -machine communication. Um, data is being generated by those devices that we never had before. 90% um, of the data that's created over the last 10 years was never captured or analyzed. Isn't that astounding? Here we're all talking about how valuable data is, but 90% of the data that's been generated is not captured. You know, part of the reason for that is the fact that the bandwidth to capture that hasn't kept up with the rate of growth of the data that's being generated. We simply can't ship it all back. 
But what I find even more astonishing is that by 2017, in just a couple of years, it's projected that the compute power of all our cell phones collectively around the world and the storage is going to surpass the capability of all the worldwide servers. You know, what are the implications for that as we look at the challenges for how to handle sustainability in food and agriculture sector where much of what's happening really is out in the field and, and requires mobile? We need to have the data at the edge and compute at the edge. So here's an example of one industry where this new data and computing paradigm are transforming it that is another life science that I think is a nice analogy for agriculture and food. Um, healthcare. This uh, rapid exogenous growth of data is transforming healthcare. So when you go to a doctor and they have the electronic medical records, that clinical data for a, a person, average person in the, um, in the industrial world is about four terabytes of data. But your genomic data from sequencing the human genome is about six terabytes. Now, thanks to the cost of gene sequencing coming down, the speed of the algorithms, we're able to use that data more and more. But the exogenous data, the social data, what you ate, how you exercises, all that exogenous data that we've never had access to before, it's huge. It's 1,100 terabytes, huge compared to the clinical data where, um, we've been using traditionally. And studies show that 60% of, of the effect of health outcomes is from that 1,100 terabytes. So it's hugely valuable. And thanks to the mobile devices, the wearables, the Fitbits, you know, thanks to patient-owned and operated healthcare um, units, we're able now to collect that data. And in the future, you know, one of the, you know, one of the aspects that's really been a challenge for health researchers is we know what you buy, but no one knows what you eat. You know, so we'll be able to capture that data and do personalized nutrition. And this data is allowing us to, to step away and step back from cohort-based medicine to look at personalized medicine. And when I think about agriculture in particular, I think of a farmer as being a doctor for the soil, for the livestock, you know, for the plants. And so the same trend that we're seeing in personalized medicine, the same exogenous factors, the same compute, is, is really what's happening in precision agriculture today. So in addition to this explosion of data, we have coupled with it a new era of computing that we're entering, which we call cognitive systems. And in the past, there's been two other eras of computing that we talked about. This is, of course, tabulating systems. We went into an era of programmable systems where we were programming deterministically. And this new system that we're seeing now is well positioned and needed for harnessing this vast amount of unstructured data. And it's different. It's different because it mimics how humans learn. It interacts with us in a natural way, like your Siri phone through natural language or other, other avenues. And it learns using a, a, um, a probabilistic methods based on patterns. So I think some of the benefits that we're seeing in information technology with this explosion of data, computing on the edge, and cognitive systems are really going to transform uh, the tools and technologies that we're able to bring to bear for looking at sustainability. Now, you're all aware of these trends. You know, these global trends are presenting a lot of new opportunities for us, whether it's the demand for agricultural production, dwindling natural resources, what we've been talking about quite a bit, you know, increasing volatility in commodity prices, concerns about food safety, which, you know, affect not just an individual company, but the whole sector, or how agriculture's um, gains in developing countries are really changing global business dynamics. What I think is really exciting and an opportunity is how to harness the wealth of data that's becoming available to address these. So now I'd like to take a break, give you the rest, and show you uh, a video that we call Recipe for Innovation Using Cognitive Computing. Oh. <coughs> Oh, it's 
not working. I'm sorry. Search engines are great for helping. Search engines are great for helping us. Let's try again. Search engines are great for helping us find what's out there. But what about things that haven't been invented? I don't think this is gonna work. Search engines are. Search engines are great for helping us find what's out there. But what about things that haven't been invented yet? That's what cognitive computing is all about. Unlike a search engine, a cognitive system doesn't just find old ideas. It thinks up new ones. IBM researchers are experimenting with a cognitive system that helps just combine existing ingredients to create brand new recipes. Soon, this cognitive system will be cooking up new ideas for designers, developers, marketers, everyone. For more on computing, cuisine, and creativity, dig in at ibm.com slash cognitive cooking. So, did anyone understand that video? Oh? Well, <laughs> didn't work so good. I wanted to use some video to shake things up. And I know this is the last session of the day. You just had your coffee and we're into the home stretch here of really a wonderful day that's been filled with a lot of information. So um, I'm sorry that didn't work, but our cognitive materials are available online. Um, just to drive home the fact that we're expanding the state of the art in trying to teach computers about how to be creative. So we've developed a system in particular, one of them called Chef Watson. It's actually looking how to do novel combinations of flavors and it, fragrances based on the chemistry interactions uh, to help people come up with unintuitive but yet pleasing senses. Um, so I'd be happy to tell anyone more about that uh, after, after the talk. So now I've told you a little bit about IBM research. You know, I've talked a little bit about the trends that we see happening in data and computing that hopefully spark some ideas about how they might be useful as we think about sustainability. And now I'd like to switch to the third part of the three things that I had hoped to talk to you in the, the time that I have left. And that's to just run through a few of the projects we have going on in IBM research to give you a sample of some of the work we're doing in food and agribusiness that, around sustainability. So one of the aspects of sustainability that we think about is around food safety. And in particular, the challenges of commingling and of the techniques that we're trying today that don't seem to quite work. So we're looking at how can you use food as its own sensor? So could the food material tell you when the, when the refrigeration hasn't worked or when it had been adulterated? So this novel approach is, um, is thanks to a consortium that's launched with Mars Corporation that we call Sequencing the Food Supply Chain. And the idea is that along with every food stuff, there's a lot of bacteria. And because the cost of gene sequencing has come down, that we can actually sequence and understand the outer envelope of the bacterial content in the food to know if something's happened to it. So our hypothesis is, if there's a particular fingerprint for this metagenomic material from, say, Ireland, and you receive a shipment, and you test it, and you know what normal is, you'll be able to detect did it really come from Ireland, or was it sourced from another location? You'll know if it was adulterated. You'll know if perhaps no one noticed that the refrigeration truck broke down because the metagenomic material, the bacterial profile, will be slightly different because the heat was different. This is really a novel approach that we're trying in building out a bioinformatics system to tackle the challenges of food safety. Um, and we'd like to invite you to think about it and welcome new members to join it. Um, you may not have known that at IBM Research we have a large computational biology group. Um, they're focused on our, our consortium for food safety, but in addition, they're tackling plant diseases, in particular citrus screening. People looking at molecular models have developed approaches, and then our teams at the Almaden Research Lab, who've been developing special materials for semiconductors, have actually developed what we call ninja polymers to develop targeted approaches. So we're actually working on how to address 
citrus greening for a large beverage client. As many other uh, applications, um, our additional um, polymer scientists also work on controlled release polymers, which are important for sustainability. Um, and so, in lieu of time, let me talk to you about just a few more projects before ending. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, working with us, looked at how we could improve the ecological system for a sandy soil area in Flint River, Georgia. Here we're using high precision, highly accurate weather forecasting that we've been working on for more than a decade called Deep Thunder um, to look at how we can improve and advance um, precision agriculture, in particular pivot head irrigation. Um, we are working with Rensselaer Polytechnic and a nonprofit, the Fund for Lake George. We have the most highly instrumented lake in the world, trying to determine why there's a dead spot in the center of the lake, which we believe is due to salt runoff. You know, we know that agrochemicals are often wasted, so how can you find out their impact? Uh, we've also worked with E.J. Gallo Wineries recently this year being awarded the Vintner um, Award, developing the first precision drip irrigation approach. We've actually created the prototype system at our lab in Yorktown Heights and uh, analyzed ND by images to, to develop a precision water plan for the week. This is important, of course, in grapes, uh, where we've been testing the system for multiple years to be able to control both underperforming and overperforming areas to have maximum um, output at the highest quality. Um, um, you may know that it's very difficult to do analysis of data in this sector because of the multiple levels of geospatial data that's needed. Curating geospatial temporal data over the long spans of time that are needed to look at multiple years, different climate um, weather patterns makes analytics for sustainability challenging. So we have developed curation systems, in particular, one that we call PAIRS, which makes the multiple layers of data aligned and discoverable and queryable, so taking tasks that used to take um, hours down to minutes. We're also working with more than 10 teams at IBM Research on drone farming and are actively looking for partners in this area if anyone has interest. And at our Kenya Research Lab, you may have heard the BBC recently profile a project we're doing with IoT to help farmers who are working in the city keep track of their fields uh, or greenhouses that um, in particular are watered by tank irrigation to make sure that those don't run out of water and the crops aren't affected. And here in the Dublin Lab, one of the Keystone projects revolves smarter refrigeration. Um, this chart shows a, a grocer work that we've been working with for the past three years, their actual energy savings um, since working with us. The project had two phases, one on the demand side and the other on the supply side. And you can see for yourself how the energy costs have dropped. Um, so just in short, I'm at the end of my time and I've given you a whirlwind tour um, of how big data and cognitive systems, I hope, are going to enable new innovations across the agribusiness value chain. And I'd love to continue this conversation. Um, and so please, if anyone would like to talk to us, we have several people from the IBM team here, Virgil, Richie, and Michael, and myself. And we'd love to engage and talk to you further about any of these or your problems. So thank you very much for your time.